morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Cumberland Homesteads Baptist Church. Today is the Lord's Day, so we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. We hope that you enjoy the Lord with us here this morning. Just brief announcements. If you'll check out your bulletin with me, you'll notice on the side here that there's a perforated section. And uh, we just want to welcome our visitors. This is your first time visiting with us. If you'll fill out that section there on the side and put that in the offering place so that we can have a record of your visit. We really appreciate it. We hope that you were encouraged here today through the singing as well as um, the prayers and the preaching that you enjoy the Lord with us here today. Brief announcements before we begin worship. Um, if you'd like to donate for DDS t-shirts, um, you can see the office for that. Um, also, uh, donations are needed for youth camp and children's camp. Um, we do have a youth camp that's coming up, I believe it's Wednesday, is that right? This coming Wednesday. And so uh, you'll see the information there, campers, trying to get your, uh, your fees in, your money in as soon as possible. You can see Brother Michael if you have any questions about that. And if you'd like to give so that uh, some kids can, more children, more youth can go, uh, you can see Brother Michael about that. Again, camp is, camp is an awesome time. I've been to the kids' camp, uh, but it's the same camp, but, but for older kids, for the youth group. Um, it is a great time. The Word of God is faithfully proclaimed, faithfully sung, and it really is. It's a time to get away, in, all, in many ways, away from um, your normal activities, normal routines, and it, to really focus on the Lord. So I want to encourage you uh, to prayerfully give towards that. Um, also, Wednesday evening, July the 5th, we are going to have a 4th of July celebration, so it will be uh, Wednesday night. So it's about a week and a half from here, so it's, it's the day after the 4th. So I want to encourage you to plan to be there. And that will be something that you can invite your neighbors to, your friends to, family. I mean, uh, any lost folks. We're going to preach the gospel that night. We'll still have kids' activities, youth activities, adult activities like we do every Wednesday. Uh, but we're also going to have food and there will be fireworks that night. So it will be, be a time to fellowship, a time to enjoy the Lord together. Any other announcements? Anything I might have forgot? Anything I might have left out? All right. Well, let's approach the Lord in worship. And the way that we do that is we come admitting that we need the one that we're about to sing to and about. So between you and the Lord, if you have any unconfessed sin, this is the time to confess it. Okay? Let us approach the Lord in worship together. Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for the opportunity to come with other believers to sing your praises. God, to sit under um, your word some, Lord, hearing uh, other Christians sing these truths and convicting my heart uh, to, to be holy, to be godly, uh, to enjoy you more, to enjoy grace more, and all that you've given me in your son. And so, Lord, may we get up and sing like the redeemed and enjoy you here today. We thank you so much for Christ. And in his name I pray. Amen. Church says, stand and encourage one another in the name of Jesus.
my name is Mike Graham, and I'm the deacon of the week. And just if y'all, if there's anything we can do for you, and, and we we consider deacons, we consider ourselves servants. But if there's something that we can do, we can help you in some way. Just give us a call. My phone number's in the in the book, or I mean in the bulletin. Um, I want to follow up on something that uh, that Jared uh, mentioned a while ago. Um, how many kids you take? Got 28 kids going to uh, camp this week, and uh, I'm gonna put a number on it. It's about five. It's about five short, and that's 350 dollars a piece. Right? It, that's about the number. So, if there's any way you can help with that, uh, see Michael uh, or, or Jared, or, uh, but but they need some help. I mean, we've got you know, we've got a lot of it covered, but we still need some more. So if you can, if you, uh, you want to contribute to that, uh, find a way to help that out. Uh, we we appreciate that. Michael appreciated it. And the kids, that, you know, there's, we have a lot of uh, kids, a number of kids that are taking it. You know, the parents don't come to church. So, you know, and a lot of, this is a way that we can uh, get ministry to them. So if you can help, we appreciate that. Uh, let's go to the Lord of Prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you that uh, we have an opportunity to come into your house and worship you. We thank you for that. We, we ask that you help us to prepare ourselves this morning for the words we're about to hear. We ask that you help us in our walk each week as we can maybe minister to somebody else and say, Lord, that's what you've commanded us to do. Lord, now we ask that you, you take this offering and use it to, to the betterment of your, uh, Lord, of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, 
sa uh, Shiloh Church of God of Prophecy. I didn't know y'all had a Pentecostal for a pastor, right? <laughs> Turn your Bibles to the book of Psalms. And today we're discussing, we're begin, I'm going to begin a new series um, discussing the names of God. Why study the names of God? So we're going to spend several weeks examining the names of God. And today is, is kind of an introduction to that series. And I, I just want to encourage y'all to think through why God has revealed Himself, for what purpose, why did He give these names? And so we're going to discuss that some today. But uh, as I was studying for this sermon, I came across an illustration that I think is helpful. And it actually comes from a Reader's Digest. But it says, it was a story. It said, when the 1960s ended, San Francisco's um, hate Ashbury district reverted to high rent. And many hippies moved around uh, down the coast to Santa Cruz. <coughs> They had children and got married, too, though in no particular sequence. But they didn't name their children Melissa or Brett. People in the mountains around Santa Cruz were accustomed to their children playing frisbee with little time, warp, or spring fever. And eventually, moonbeam, earth, love, and precious promise all ended up in the public school. That's when the kindergarten teachers first met fruit standing. Every fall, according to tradition, parents bravely apply name tags to their children, kiss them goodbye, and send them off to school on the bus. So it was for fruit stand. The teachers thought the boy's name was odd, but they tried to make the best of it. Would you like to play with the blocks, fruit stand, they offered? And later, fruit stand, how about a snack? He accepted hesitantly. By the end of the day, his name didn't seem much odder than Heather's or Sunray's. At dismissal time, the teachers led the children out to the buses. Fruit stand, do you know which one is your bus? He didn't answer. That wasn't strange. He hadn't answered them all day long. Lots of children are shy on the first day of school. It didn't matter. The teachers had instructed the parents to write the names of their children's bus stops on the reverse side of their name tags. The teachers simply turned over the tag, and there neatly printed was the word Anthony. <laughs> Friends, our, our names are important to us. Um, we often get upset if someone continually mispronounces our name or if they constantly forget our names. You know, our names are important. They're, they're an identifier for us. They reveal something about who we are. Now, we did not choose our names, but as we grow accustomed to it and get older, we expect people to get our names wrong. And so if our names are significant to us, how much more so are the names that God has revealed significant to Him? See, what, what we must understand is that the names that we have of God in Scripture were not created by the Israelites. They were not created by the people. This is God's self-revelation. This is who God, God tells us who to call Him. God has told us who He is. We don't just sit in a corner or sit in a cave or sit in the dark and think our way to God. God must reveal Himself to us. We do not reach to God. He reaches to us. And if He did not reach down to us, if He did not reveal Himself to us, the creature would never understand the Creator. So it's important for us to understand that. He is so much other than us. And that's what I want to emphasize here today is the otherness of God or the transcendence of God or how much greater God is in His creation. And so we'll look at Psalm 90, uh, verse 1 through 2, and we can answer the question just briefly here. Is who made God? Who created God? You know, that's one of the questions. If you're a parent, you've you heard your children say, or perhaps you've asked that question, well, who made God? If God made everything, who made Him? And the answer is, is God is the only one who has always existed. He's the only self-existing being. No one made God. God did not even make Himself. God is God, and there is no other. And Psalm 90, 1 through 2, picks this up, says, Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever You had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, You are God. So from everlasting, in the past, right, in the future, Everlasting to everlasting, right? Forevermore, God is God. So He is distinct from His creation in that way. 
And so we do not think ourselves to God. We do not logically, you know, I, I remember back in, um, back in the theologically liberal days of the seminary, I attend Southern Seminary, Mark Dever was teaching a class, and, he, and they, it was on the doctrine of God. They were studying who God is, you know, theology. And, and um, you know, he asked the question, who is God? And a student raised his hand, and he said, I like to think of God as, as loving but not wrathful. I like to think of God as accepting but not discriminating, and all, all these things. And the professor, once the student finished, he said, you know, John, thank you so much for telling us about yourself. We're here to study God. It doesn't matter what you think about God. Ultimately, it matters what God has revealed about Himself. You do not sit in a cave and like to, and create all these thoughts in your head about who God is. You open up the Word and He reveals to you through the Scriptures who He is. And so it doesn't matter what we think about God. It matters what God has revealed about Himself. And when we study the names of God, that, that's the significance of His names as He is revealing who He is. And so the first thing I want you to see, we study the names of God because, one, God names Himself to reveal who He is to us. We did not name God. He names Himself. Now, I know all of you, your parents named you for the most part, right? Okay, so we, somebody named us. But the reality is with God, nobody names God. He reveals who He is. We do not define God. He defines Himself. We do not trust our thoughts about God. We trust His revelation. We cannot bridge the knowledge gap between us and God. We must bridge the gap or we will not know God. And what's amazing about the Word of God, the Bible, is that through the prophets, through the apostles, through Christ, God the Son incarnate, God has came to man and revealed Himself to us. We do not have to wonder God, wonder who God is. He has told us who He is. And so we just pick up the book. Pick up the book and study it. Read it cover to cover. And believe what it says. Because the people who wrote it were carried along by the Holy Spirit to where so much, even though their, their personalities are intact, and even though they really wrote it, real men with personality wrote the scriptures. God so superintended the process that what they wrote was the inerrant, infallible word of God. So where the Bible speaks, God speaks. And so study the scriptures to understand who God is. Otherwise, you're just talking about yourself. If you want to tell me who God is, if it doesn't match up with the scriptures, you're just telling me about you. What you think. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we think about God. Every, billions of people have thoughts about who God is, but is everyone right? You know, there are some who believe that God is okay with walking in churches with bombs strapped to your chest. Are they right? No. Not even close. Not even close. But if the standard is our thoughts and not this book, how do you come against those who think differently of God than you do? You have to follow the Word of God. We cannot compromise on the Word of God because the Word of God is God's revelation, particularly we're discussing His names because to know God's names is to know God. God is linked to the names He has revealed. You know, we are often today not linked to our names in the same way that God is. My full name is Jared Heath Moore. I was born two months early uh, in Sparta, Tennessee. And so I almost died. You know, you imagine 36 years ago, you know, they didn't have, I was too much premature, so they didn't have a lot of, uh, that was a big preemie. Not like Graham, good grief. <laughs> Graham was, what, nine pounds? Creamy? Yeah, you see him on the Yeah. Yeah, I was four pounds. But that's still a big premium for its early. And, um, you know, mom had to name me quickly because they had to have my name before they sent me to the family building. And so she just came up with the name. See, we have three older sisters. So they, she thought I was going to be a girl. I still got an ornament on my mom's tree. It's mine, but it's Rebecca. <laughs> 
And they didn't, they didn't know the baby, what the baby was before the baby was born back then. So I was Rebecca, and mom, so she had come up with this name. I don't know where she come up with Jared Heath, but it was just like, hey, I like that, you know, name him Jared Heath. And, um, and so I passed that on, Caden Heath, Ian Jared, and Jude is named after my mom, Jude, but Henry is her dad, but his initials are the same as mine. And so we, we've passed on the family thing, but there's really, other than family, there's no meaning behind the names that we've given our kids. But with God, there is. In Scripture, names are distinguished. You know, name was a marker that separated you from others. It told who you were. And many times, who your parents wanted you to be. You know, we learn from the beginning in Genesis that Adam named the animals. And the Bible says that he named them in accordance with their nature. So he looked at them and said, oh, you look like a... And he named it. And uh, Scripture spells out the meaning of many names. Let me just list these off to you. Eve, Cain, Seth, Noah, Babel, Ishmael, Esau, Jacob, Moses... Jesus, and so on. And many times a name was changed or a surname was added when the, a person acted in another capacity. Think of Abram being changed to Abraham. Um, Sarah, Israel, Joshua, Jedediah, Mera, Peter. Remember, he was Cephas. Peter was Cephas or Cephas. Following his ascension, Christ received a name that is above every name, according to Hebrews 1.4. And in the New Jerusalem, a new name is given to believers, according to Revelation 2.17, chapter 3.12, chapter 22, verse 4. And the same is true of God's name. There's an, an intimate, close link between God and His name. And according to Scripture, this link is not accidental, it's not arbitrary, as if it's picked at random, but it is to reveal who God is. And so it reveals His attributes. And this is why it's so heinous to use the Lord's name in vain, to use God's name in vain. And by the way, that's not just attaching God's name or saying God's name irreverently, you know, the, the man not to use the Lord's name in vain. If the Lord's name is who He is, it reveals who He is. Anytime you do something, Anytime you do something irreverently towards God, so anytime you sin, you're using the Lord's name in an irreverent way. You're, you're sinning against God. It's not just the words we say or the thoughts we have. Oftentimes we think of using the Lord's name as something you attach to the word you use it irreverently. But if His name is who He is, and any time you sin against Him, you're using His name in vain. His revelation reveals that God's names are great, holy, awesome. He is a high refuge, a strong tower. And by proper names, particularly the name Yahweh, God made Himself known to Israel. He revealed himself to Israel by the angel in whom the Lord's name was present. And by him he put his name on the children of Israel, caused his name to be remembered, put his name among them and made it to dwell there, especially in the temple built for his name. And now his name lives in the temple, according to 2 Chronicles 29. By that name he saves, and on account of that name he cannot abandon Israel. It's interesting, God appeals to himself as why he cannot Abandon his promises to Israel. Why he cannot abandon his promises to us. And Israel may not blaspheme and desecrate that name or use it in vain. Instead that name must be invoked, passed on in story, magnified, known, feared, exalted, expected, sought out, sanctified. In the New Testament God's name acquires an even richer and deeper meaning. For the word or the logos was in the beginning with God and is in the bosom of the Father, has made Him known and revealed His name. Since no one knows the Father except the Son, only those to whom the Son reveals the Father gain knowledge of God. 
Those who confess the Son have the Father also. According to 1 John 2, 23. Those who have seen the Son have seen the Father. The name of Jesus Christ accordingly guarantees the truth of our knowledge of God and all the associated benefits. He is called Jesus because He saves His people. I mean, think about all the names in Scripture and the significance that is attached to those names to reveal the identity of these individuals. I mean, not only you, you think of Jesus, you think of Yeshua, which I, I think is, a, is pointing back to Joshua, who led the people in, his people into the promised land. I mean, it, it's interesting when you, you start looking at the names that are revealed in Scripture and the great significance they have, that they have concerning Revelation. So we see the first point is that God names Himself to reveal who He is. And the second thing I want you to see is that the reason why we study the name of God is because we exist for the purpose of knowing God. You want to know why God made you? It's to know Him. God made you, everyone here, that your purpose is to know God, is to know Him, is to love Him. God made us in His image for the purpose of reflecting Him, according to Genesis 1, 26-28. And if we know Him... We will seek to reflect Him. Now, sin hinders us from doing that. Thus, we need Christ's finished work to save us and to conform us to His image. But the reality is that sin does not reflect God. Sin makes us reflect the opposite of God. And before we do what we were created to do, which is to love God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, everything we do earns us more and more of God's wrath. If you're here and you're an unbeliever, you never trusted in Christ, never repented of your sins. Even the good that you do heaps up more and more of God's wrath towards you. Because you're trying to get to God apart from the Son. You're trying to get to God apart from what Jesus has done for you. And so if you're not trusting in Christ, if you're not trusting in Christ for your salvation, you're trying to earn God's favor in some way or another. By being a good person, by, you know, if I, if I do enough good deeds... And the reality is, if you're, if you're doing that, then your good deeds just keep up more and more of God's wrath. Because you're rejecting the Son of God. You're rejecting Christ. And so we must come to God through Christ by the Spirit. Listen to what Colossians 1, 15 through 16 says. And this was actually our Bible verse for Vacation Bible School. He, being Christ, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So every human being on earth was created for Christ, was created for his glory. And make no mistake for it, everybody in this room will glorify Christ in one way or another. And sadly, those who, those who reject Him glorify Him through enduring His righteous, holy wrath. But those who come to God through Christ receive grace, receive salvation. And so we're pleading with the world, we're pleading with you to come and enjoy grace, enjoy salvation. Come and be cleansed of your sin. Come and be cleansed of your guilt. Because make no mistake, you will glorify Christ in one way or another. He made you for that purpose. Our prayer is that you glorify Him through enjoying salvation instead of suffering in wrath. You know, people speak of Christ and they, and they, they speak of His love and they speak of His joy. But when you read in Revelation about Christ's return, the Bible, <laughs> the Bible displays a line. You know, here he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But when he returns, he's not coming back as a lamb to be slain again. He's coming to conquer. He's coming to crush his enemies. And so we plead with folks to repent and believe the good news of Christ. Accept the lamb or face the lion. We want you to, to trust in the lamb of God. Come and enjoy. I mean, if he was slain for you, you don't have to be slain. Come and enjoy forgiveness. But if you reject that grace, you reject that love, 
then you're going to receive wrath. You're going to receive punishment. In other words, you're going to receive what you deserve. It's amazing. We offer folks, and I spend my life offering folks salvation. You can come to Christ and literally be forgiven for everything you've ever done or ever will do. The guilt that's in your heart, you don't have to carry anymore. You can literally be reconciled to God. You can be reconciled to your Creator. You can enjoy Him forever. Eternal life. Rust can't touch it. Sickness can't touch it. Death can't even touch it. And we spend our time offering folks that. And amazingly, people had rather live for a temporary life that they know they cannot hold on to. They'd rather build a kingdom that they know that they cannot take with them. That they're just going to give to somebody else to enjoy. Kingdom of dirt. They'd rather spend all their time doing these things than to come and enjoy eternal life in Christ. And it's amazing how deceptive sin is. It's amazing how deceptive I mean, you can know your Creator. And not just know Him, as in many ways, the way the Islamic God is portrayed as a distant God, that you might get to go to heaven if you are good enough. Maybe. The only way to assure that is death and a holy war. And we're offering... You can know God as Father. You don't have to go through an intermediary. You can go to God directly because the Son is the high priest. I'm not a priest. You don't have to come to me. You can go to God directly. Because Christ is the high priest. Only that, He's the prophet, He's the king. God made mankind and He determines why He made us. We do not determine our purpose. God does. And there is no greater pursuit for man than to know God. For Christians, we know the only way to know God the Father is through God the Son, by God the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul says, Yet there is for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Friend, I'm convinced. You, you want to know why I'm doing a series on the name of God? I'm convinced that knowing God is literally the answer to everything that plagues Christianity. Every sin that you struggle with is directly related to your knowledge of God and how much you believe that. Every sin you struggle with. Every sin you struggle with. So, so think about this for a second. For example, if you believe God is sovereign, you believe God is all good, how do you think that that will affect you whenever you get sick? How do you think it will affect you? I mean, having that knowledge, having that understanding, you'll be able to enjoy God even in the midst of deep sorrow, even in the midst of deep suffering. You know, I, I see preachers, preachers on TV, and they're constantly emphasizing what we must do. Constantly emphasizing what we must do. Listen, we need to know what we must do. But when you're, what happens when you're sick and you can't do anything? What are you going to hold on to? When, you, when, you, when you're the thief on the cross, and you're about to die, and you trust in Christ, and you can't do anything for God, except maybe pray which is still very, very important, obviously, right? But hanging it. But he's just as saved as you're on. Saved by grace. You know, when I speak to folks who are in the nursing home, I want to encourage them. I want to encourage them that they still know God. They still know God and they can know Him in a very sweet and special way. They can know Him as Father. The greatest reason we sin is because we struggle with knowing God consistently. If we have a sin problem, we have a knowledge of God problem. 
Some may argue, I know God greatly. But if you really know Him, you believe what you know. See, there's two dangers here. There's a danger of not having knowledge of God, where we, we never study the Scriptures, we never seek to understand who God is. There's that danger. And then the other side is that we study the Scriptures greatly, but we don't really believe it. Or we believe bits and pieces, and we don't have a lot of faith in what we study. So we're kind of like a, we can win Bible trivia, but we're quick to depart from God. If you know God intimately and believe in Him, you view God as infinitely beautiful, as infinitely valuable. And if God is your standard for beauty, for holiness, for worth, for glory, for things that are worthy to pursue, everything else pales in comparison. So once you understand who God is and you embrace Him as Father, and you believe He is all good, you believe He is all holy, He is all powerful, and, and He's your Father. You know, the, the one who made the billions of stars and the millions of galaxies and the sun and all the things that make show us what small is. God is bigger than all those things. That God cares about you. And if you believe that, it is going to affect how you live. It's going to affect what you do, what you say. You believe that God is with you in your trials. It's going to affect how you endure those trials. The maker of everything is with you in, the moment, in that moment. He knew it was coming before you did. You know, I mean, think about know how knowing God is going to affect your response in all these situations. And so when you're faced with temporary satisfaction of sin... And you're faced with pleasing God. Once you understand all that God has done for you and who He is, how do you think that's going to affect the decisions you make? And see, I, I fear for these churches that are constantly emphasizing what we must do, the good works we must accomplish. Without And, and there's no anchor to hold. Why should we do these things? Why should we do these good works? Because God is all good. I mean, because of who God is. You know what? You remember when God uh, said to Satan, you know, where did you come from? He says, I've running, been running to and fro on the earth. And God says to Satan, hey, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Job? Now, there's none like him on the earth. And Satan tells God, I said, listen, does he serve you for no reason? If you take away all that you're giving him, he'll curse you to your face. See, Satan's making a statement about Job that he only served God for his blessings, but he's also making a statement about God. He's saying, God, you're not worthy to be worshipped unless you bless people. He's making a statement about the names of God. About who God is apart from His gifts. Let me ask you something, friend. Is God worthy of worship whenever you are secure financially? Is He worthy of worship when you're broke? Is He worthy of worship when you're healthy? Is He worthy of worship when you're sick? Is He worthy of worship when He gives? Is He worthy of worship when He takes away? We know the answer, right? But what we know about, about God will directly affect how we endure those situations. How we endure the suffering that often comes in this life. I, I'm convinced, friend, that everything that plagues Christianity is about knowing God. Knowing who He is. Enjoying who He is. Because you realize, you realize that whether you're healthy or sick or you're wealthy or poor, who He is does not change. And so if you're basing your joy and your happiness and your life on who He is, you can enjoy Him even in the midst of deep sorrow. Friend, I, I've experienced sorrow. Some of you have experienced great sorrow. And I'll tell you, friend, when I realize and am reminded of who God is and how He has not changed, how from everlasting to everlasting He is God, it comforts me. I do not find comfort in the mirror. I do not find comfort in the situation. I don't find comfort in my bank account. But I find comfort 
in who God is. And so, friend, if we can know who God is, you can have joy in the midst of deep sorrow. And finally, I want you to see point three. We study the names of God because only when we know who God is do we fully understand who Christ is. Flip over real quick to Psalm 102. And friend, this is the final point. Flip over to Psalm 102. So just a few chapters over. Psalm 102, beginning in verse number 25, we're going to go through verse 27. Psalm 102, verse 25. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. So that, that, I mean, that's an amazing statement. And what's even more amazing, when you turn over to the New Testament, flip over to Hebrews chapter 1. And the author of Hebrews takes this verse, this passage of Scripture in Psalm, and applies it to Jesus Christ. And so who is this Jesus Christ? Who is he? Is he just a good man? Is he just a sinless man? Or is he the God man? See, Islam will say he's a prophet. They may even say he's sinless. I'm not sure. But they don't believe he's the son of God. If you talk to a Muslim, they'll say, we respect Jesus more than anyone. Well, and I remember asking one, well, do you believe he's the son of God? Well, no. <laughs> well, you don't respect Jesus. Because the author of Hebrews sure believed him to be the son of God. Not only, not only the son of God. But God the Son. Good Hebrews chapter 1. Well, let, me, let me just begin reading in verse 1 here. <coughs> Hebrews 1 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He created the world. Who can create but the Creator? Who can create but God? He's making a claim concerning who the Son is. Who is Jesus Christ? He's God the Son. Now listen, look, look, just follow me here, friend. Jesus, what's amazing about the incarnation, okay, Mary giving birth to Jesus, is that Jesus is not a human person. He is a divine person with two natures. This is what we taught our kids in VBS. All right, everybody say that. Divine person, two natures. Okay, so you have the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, coming, uniting himself to a human nature. So, what we taught him in VBS. Who is Jesus? God the Son. Come on, kids, tell me how you remember. Come on, you remember? Okay, fully God and fully man, right? So you have the divine person acting through two natures simultaneously. So while Jesus is crying in the manger, being born, learning through his humanity, suffering, dying, he's also holding the cosmos together. And it's, it's pretty miraculous when you consider that the very people who crucified him and nailed him to the cross, he was making their hearts beat as they killed him. Who is this person? Look at Hebrews 1, verse 10. And this is the quote. This is the quote. If you look in verse 8, Hebrews 1, But of the Son, He says, and then you see verse 10, and, Kai, and, in the Greek, Kai. And so He's referring to the Son while quoting the verse you just read, Psalm 102, as being the Creator. This is God the Son that's who He is. But if you don't know the God of the Old Testament, if you don't know who He is, you don't know the names, it's going to be <laughs> peculiar when you start reading these verses. Look at verse 10. And the Lord laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same. Your years will have no end. 
Now, what a, what a strange thing for the author of Hebrews to say because we know when Hebrews was written, was Jesus walking the earth at that time? No. He would already ascended. If, they, if the church knew that he was dead, what a strange thing to say to claim that he is from everlasting to everlasting. The early church claimed that he is God the Son incarnate. He is not just a man like any other man. He is God the Son. And so the final thing I want you to see, friend, is that only when we know who God is can we fully understand who Christ is. Who is Christ? He is the God of the Old Testament. Particularly God the Son, but God nonetheless. And so when we study the names of God, that's speaking of Christ. When we study Yahweh, Elohim, when we study Jehovah, I mean, when we study the names of God, we're speaking of Christ. I mean, you, you could rightfully say, we, we say God the Son incarnate, you could say Yahweh the Son. Elohim the Son. I mean, we're, we're, so we're not just speaking of the God of the Old Testament, we're speaking of the God of both Testaments, particularly revealed in the New Testament as triune. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so if you want to understand who Christ is, you need to understand who God is. And so we see we study the names of God because His names reveal who He is to us. We exist for the purpose of knowing Him. And only when we know who God is do we fully understand who Christ is. And so, friend, what will we do with this reality? You know, I'm reminded of a uh, friend of mine Actually, my brother-in-law, and he, he, was, he was just being honest, and I understand what he's saying. Uh, he was at church, he, he was at Calvin Theological Seminary studying for his doctorate. And so he, he's up there studying, and, and they're worshiping the local church. And he said, uh, a lady came in, and uh, she'd actually had a, one of their church members had had a miscarriage. And so she was sorrowful, but she made a statement about trusting God in His promises. Trusting God in His providence. And he said he was taken aback by that. Saying, you know, I don't know in that situation that I could have the same outlook as she did. So here you've got a guy who's getting a PhD in theology. One of the brightest guys I know. I wish y'all could talk with him. He's, he's really otherworldly in his, uh, in his knowledge. Um, but here he was taken aback by the simple faith of a fellow Christian. And so we, we've got to be reminded that yes, dive into the Scriptures. Yes, study the Scriptures. But friend, if you don't believe and embrace what you learn, you're in danger of becoming just a bunch of knowledge. Okay? So friend, let's conclude. I'm going to ask you, Brother Kenny would come. Let's all stand and respond how God may be leading. What will we do with what's being presented? What will we do with who God has revealed Himself to be. Will we study to learn who God is? Will we enjoy what we learn? How will we respond?